From the Cube Studios in Palo Alto and Boston, connecting with thought leaders all around the world, this is a Cube Conversation. Hi everybody, this is Dave Vellante and welcome to this Cube Conversation. You know, the, this, we've been following a company called Actifio for quite some time now. They, they've really popularized the concept of copy data management, a really innovative Boston-based, Waltham-based company. And with me, uh, Brian Regan, who's the Chief Marketing Officer, and Paul Forty, who's the newly minted Chief Revenue Officer of Actifio. Guys, great to see you. I wish we were face-to-face -face at your, uh, your, your June event, but uh, this will have to do. Yeah, Thanks, welcome. Dave. You bet, Dave. Yeah, so, you know, Brian, you've been on theCUBE a bunch. I'm going to start with Paul, if that's okay. Paul, you know, let's talk a little bit about your, your background. Um, you've, you've done a number of stints at a, a variety of companies, you know, big companies like IBM and, and, and others as well. Uh, what attracted you to Actifio? Yeah, so good question, Dave. I would say, um, in all honesty, I've been a software guy and candidly a, a data specific uh, leader for many, many years. And so, um, IT infrastructure, particularly associated around data, has always been sort of my uh, forte for a pun on words there. Um, and, uh, and so Actifio is just smack dab in the middle of that, right? And so um, when I was looking for my next adventure, uh, you know, I had an opportunity to, uh, to meet with Ash, our CEO and founder, and describe and discuss kind of what Actifio was all about. And um, candidly, the the number of connections that we had that were the same, the, our, a lot of our OEM relationships are with people that I actually worked with and for, and some that worked for me historically. So it was almost this perfect world, right? And I'm a Boston guy, so it was in my, in my old backyard. And uh, it was just a perfect, yeah, it was a perfect match for what I was looking for, which was really a small growth company that was trying to you know, get to the next level. Uh, that had compelling technology in a space that I was super familiar with and could understand and, and articulate the value proposition. Well, as we say in, in Boston, Polly, we got to get you back here. I know, I know. <laughs> yeah. back. So I packed my cat. Yeah. So, I Brian, um, let's, years. I still got let's, it. Let's talk about the let's talk about the climate right now. I mean, nobody expected this, of course. I mean, it's funny. I was I saw Ash. Uh, at an event in, in Boston last fall. And we were talking like, hey, what are you expecting for next year? Yeah, a little bit of softening, but you know, nobody expected this sort of black swan. But you guys, I just got your press release. You put it out, you had a good, you had a good quarter, you had a record first quarter. Yeah. Um, what's going on in the marketplace? How, how are you guys doing? Yeah, well, uh, I think that um, today more than, uh, than ever, um, businesses are realizing that uh, data um, is what is actually going to carry them through this crisis. Um, and that data, whether it's um, changing the nature of how companies interact with their customers, um, how they uh, manage through their supply chain, uh, and, uh, and frankly, how they take care of their employees um, is all very data centric. And so businesses that are protecting that data that are helping businesses get faster access to that data um, and ultimately give them choice as to where they manage that data on premises in the cloud and a hybrid configuration. Those are the businesses that are really going to be top of a CIO's mind. I think our Q1 is a demonstration that uh, customers voted with their wallets and put their confidence in Actifio as an important part of their data supply chain. You know, Paul, uh, I want to come back to you. Uh, yeah. First of all, you're, you're, I want to let people know you're an ex, you're an ex Army Ranger. So thank you for your service. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah. Who are and, Rangers? And, boy. You know, I was talking to Frank Slootman. Uh, we we I interviewed him the other day, and he was sharing with me sort of how he manages, and and he says he doesn't manage by a playbook. He's a situational manager, and that's something that he learned in the military. Okay. Well, this is we're this is a situation. So. Yeah. <laughs> And, yeah. and that really is kind of how you're trained. Um, and, and of course, we've never seen anything like this, but you're trained to deal with things that you've never seen before. So how, how are you seeing organizations generally, Actifio specifically, kind of manage through this crisis? What are some of the moves that you're advising, recommending? Give us some insight there. 
Yeah, so I, I, it's really interesting. It's a, it's, it's funny that you mentioned my military background because I was just having this discussion with one of my leaders the other day uh, that you know one of the things that they train for in the military is the eventuality of chaos, right? And so when you um, when you do an exercise, they we, we will literally tap the leader on the shoulder and say, "Okay, you're now dead," and without that person being allowed to speak, they take a knee and the unit has to go on, and so. What happens is you, you learn by muscle memory, like how to react in times of crisis or, uh, and you know, this is a classic example of leadership in crisis. And so, um, so it's just, it's just interesting. Like, so, so to me, you have a playbook. I think everybody needs to start with a playbook and then start with a plan. I can't remember if it was Mike Tyson, but one of, one of my famous quotes was, you know, that, you know, plan is good until somebody punches you in the face, right? <laughs> That's the reality of what just happened to business across the globe is it just got punched in the face. And so you got a playbook that you rely on uh, and then you have to remain nimble and creative uh, and, and candidly opportunistic. And from a leadership perspective, I think you can't lose your confidence, right? So I've watched some of my friends and I've watched some other businesses uh, cripple in the midst of this pandemic uh, because they're afraid. Instead of, you know, instead of looking at this in my first commentary, at our first staff meeting, Brian, you probably remember it was this, okay, so what makes Actifio great in this environment? Like, not why is it not great, right? And so we didn't get scared. We jumped right into it. We, you know, we adjusted our playbook a little bit. And candidly, we just had a record quarter. Uh, and we took down deals, honestly, Dave, we took down deals in every single geography around the globe to include Italy. I mean, so it was insane. It was really fun. Okay, so this wasn't just one monster deal that gave you that record quarter. It was really a broad-based uh, uh, demand. Yeah, so if you, you know, if you dug underneath the covers, you would see that we had the largest number of transactions ever in the first quarter. We had the uh, largest average selling price in the first quarter ever. We had the largest contribution from our panel partners and our OEM partners ever. Um, and we had the highest number ever. Uh, and so it was a, it was really a nice, truly balanced performance uh, across the globe and across the size of deal sets and candidly across industries. Right? Interesting. I mean, you you use the term opportunistic, and and I think you're right on. I mean, you, you obviously you don't want to be chasing ambulances. Uh, at the same time, you know, we've talked to a lot of CEOs, and essentially what they're doing, and and I'd like to get your feedback on this, Brian. You, you you're kind of reassessing the ideal profile of a customer you're reassessing your value proposition in the context of the current pandemic. And, and I noticed that you guys in your press release talked about cyber resiliency, you talked about digital initiatives, um, uh, you know, data center uh, transformations, et cetera. So maybe you could talk a little bit about that, Brian. I mean, did you do those things? How did you do those things? What kind of pace were you guys at? How did you do it remotely with everybody working from home? Give us some color on that. Sure, and uh, you know, it Ash, if he were here, he would probably remind us that Actifio was born in the midst of the 2008 financial crisis. So uh, we, we have essentially been bookended by two black swans over the last decade. Um, the, and the lessons we learned in 2008 are every bit as, as uh, relevant today. Um, everything starts with cost containment and cost reduction. Um, and, uh, and protection of the business. And so um, CIOs in the midst of this shock to the system, I think we're very much looking at um, what are the absolutely vital and critical initiatives and what is a nice to have, and I'm going to hit pause on nice to have and invest entirely in the critical initiatives. And the critical initiatives tended to be around getting people safely working for, remotely, um, getting people uh, safe access to their systems and their applications and their data. And then ultimately it also became about protecting the systems from malicious uh, individuals and state actors out there. Unfortunately, as, as we've seen in other times of crisis, uh, this is when crime and cyber crime particularly tends to spike, um, particularly against industries that don't have the strong safeguards in place to, uh, to, to really ensure the resiliency of their applications. So we very much went a little bit back to the 2008 playbook around helping people get control of their costs, helping people continue to do the things they need to do at a much more infrastructure light uh, manner. 
um, but also uh, really emphasize the fact that if you are under attack or if you are concerned that you're infected but you don't know when, you know, instant access to data and a time machine that can take you back and forth to those points in time is something that is incredibly valuable. So, so let's, let's dig into cyber resiliency. So specifically, what is Actifio doing for its customers you know, from a product standpoint, capabilities? Uh, maybe it's part of the, the 10C announcement as well, but, but can, you, can you give us some specifics on where you fit in? Let's take that use case, cyber resiliency. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I think there's, there's a, a stack of, of capabilities when it comes to cyber resiliency. At the lowest level, you need a time machine because most people don't know when they're infected. And so the ability to go back in time, test the recoverability of data, test the validity of the data um, is step one. Step two is once you've found the clean point, being able to resume operations, being able to resume the, the applications uh, uh, operation um, instantly or very rapidly is the next fix. Um, and that's something that Actifio was founded on uh, this no notion of instant access to data. Um, and then the third phase, and this is really where our partnerships really shine, is um, you probably want to go back and mitigate that risk. You want to go back and clean that system. You want to go back and find the infection and, and uh, eliminate it. Um, and that's where our partnership with IBM, for example, and Resiliency Services and their cyber incident recovery solution which takes the Actifio platform and then wrappers and a complete managed services around it. Um, so they can help the customer not only get their, their systems and applications back on their feet, but clean the systems and allow them to resume operations normally um, on a much uh, safer and, and more stable ground. Okay, so, so that's interesting. So Paul, Paul, was it uh, kind of new adoptions? Was it, was it increases from existing customers? Kind of a combination, can you talk to that? Yeah, totally. So, um, like, ironically, to, to to really come clean, we are the metrics that we had in the first quarter were very similar to the metrics that we see historically. So, the mix between um, our existing customer base and then our new customer acquisition were very similar to our historical metrics. Which, candidly, we were a little surprised by. We anticipated um, that the majority of our business would come from. Um, that safe harbor of your existing customer base, but candidly, right. um, we had a really nice split, which was great, which meant that um, you know our value proposition was resonating not only with our existing customer base where you would expect it, uh, but also in um, in any of our new customers as well who had been evaluating us that that either accelerated or uh, or just continued down the path of adoption during the time frame of uh, COVID nineteen. Um, across industries, I would say that again, um, there was there were there were some industries I would say that pushed pause, um, and so the ones that you can imagine that accelerated during um, during this past period were the ones you would think of, right? So financial institutions primarily, as well as some um, some of the medical. Um, so some of those transactions, healthcare and medical, they uh, accelerated along with financial institutions, and then I would say that. Um, that we did have some industries that pushed pause. Uh, you can probably guess what some of those are, and the majority of those are, um, were the ones that were dealing with the small and mid-sized businesses or uh, consumer-facing businesses, things like retail and stuff like that, where we typically do have a pretty nice resonance and a really nice value proposition, but um, there, there were definitely some transactions that we saw basically just pause, like we're going to come back. But overall, the... Um, yeah, the feedback was just in general, it felt like any other quarter um, and it felt like um, just pretty normal, as, as strange as that sounds, because I know speaking to a lot of my friends in peer companies, peer software companies, uh, they didn't have that experience, but we did pretty well. That's interesting, I mean, you're right. I mean, so certain industries, airlines, uh, I'm, I'm interviewing the CIO of a major resort uh, next week, you know, really interested to, to hear how they're, you know, dealing with this, but those, those are obviously depressed and they've kind of dialed everything down. Uh, but but we've, we were one of the first to report that work from home pivot. It didn't, it didn't you know, buffer the decline in IT spending that we're expecting right. to be down, you know, maybe as much as 5% this year, but it definitely offset it. What about cloud? We're seeing elevated levels in cloud demand. Uh, you guys 
you know, have offerings there. Uh, what are you seeing in cloud, guys? You want to take I'll, it, Brian? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll start, and then uh, Paul, please, please weigh in. I, I think that the uh, the move to the cloud that we've been witnessing, and the acceleration of the move to cloud that we've been witnessing over the past several years, um, probably ramped up in intensity over the last two months. Um, you know, projects that might have been on the you know, 18 to 24 month roadmap have all of a sudden been accelerated into maybe this year uh, roadmap. Um, but in terms of uh, the wholesale, uh, you know, everything moves to cloud and, and I abandoned my on-premises uh, estate, uh, I, I, I don't think we've seen that uh, quite yet. I think the, the world is still hybrid when it comes to cloud. Um, although I do think that the, um, the, the beneficiaries of this are probably the, the um, non-number one or number two cloud providers, um, but the, uh, the rest of the hyperscalers who are um, fighting for market share because now they have an opportunity to perhaps, uh, Google, for example, a strategic partner of ours, um, has a, you know, a huge uh, offering when it comes to enabling work from home and, and uh, remote work. So leveraging that as a platform and then extending into their enterprise offerings, uh, I think gives them a wedge that uh, you know, Amazon might not have, for example. So uh, this, uh, uh, it's an acceleration of interest, um, but I think it's just a continuation of the trend that we've been seeing for years. Yeah, and I would add a little bit, Dave, the, um, you know, IBM held their Think Conference this past week. I don't know if, if you had an opportunity to participate. They're one of our OEM partners. And Oh, yeah. We covered yeah, it. You know, when our CEO presented his kind of opening, um, his opening remarks, it was really about digital transformation. And he really, he really kind of put it down to two things and said, you know, any business that's trying to transform is either talking about hybrid cloud or they're talking about AI and machine learning. And that's kind of it. Right? And so every digital business is talking in one of those categories. And so when I looked at Q1, uh, it's interesting that, it, that, that we really didn't see anything other than as Brian talked about, all of the cloud business was just some version of an acceleration. Uh, but outside of that, the, the customers that are in those industries that are in position to accelerate uh, and double down during this opportunity uh, did so. And those that did not, you know, kind of just peeled back a little bit. But overall, I, I still, I would agree with, with IBM's assessment of the market that, um, you know, those are kind of the two hot spots and hybrid cloud is hot. And the good news is we've got a nice value pop right in the middle of it. Yeah, Arvind Krista talked about the, the and, and it has a, maybe not a think, but he talked earlier um, in his remarks on the earnings call, just in public statements that IBM must win the battle, the architectural battle the hybrid cloud, and also that he wants to lead with a more technical uh, sell, essentially, which is, I mean, to me, those, those two things are great news for you guys. Obviously, you know, Red Hat is the linchpin of that. Um, sure. I, I want to ask you guys about your, your conference, Data Driven. So mm -hmm. we were there last year. It was a great, really great, intimate event. Of course, you know, you can't have the physical events anymore. So you've pushed to September. You're going all digital. Well, give us the update on, on that, Brian. Mm -hmm. We're, um, we're eager to have uh, the Cube participate in our September event. So I'm sure we'll be talking more about that in the, in the coming weeks. But uh, awesome. yes, we- um, Love it. We, uh, yeah, that, exactly. So you can, uh, you can tell Frank to put that in commit. Um, so um, we, uh, we've been uh, participating in some of the other conferences, uh, I think uh, most notably uh, last week, learning a lot and, uh, and really, trying to, to cherry pick the best ideas and the best tactics for putting on a digital event. Uh, I think that as we look to September and as we look to put on a, um, a, a, a really rich digital event, one of the things that is, uh, I think, um, first and foremost in our minds is we want to actually produce more on-demand digital content, particularly from a technology standpoint, um, our technology sessions last year were oversubscribed. Um, the digital format allows people to stream whenever they can and, and frankly, as many sessions as they, uh, as they might want. So I think we can be far more efficient in terms of delivering technical content for um, the users of our technology. And then we're also eager to have, as we've done with Data Driven in the years past, um, our customers tell the story of how they're using data. And this year, 
certainly I think we're going to hear a lot of stories about, in particular, how they use data during this uh, incredible you know, uh, crisis and, uh, and hopefully renewal from the crisis. Well, one of my favorite interviews last year at your show was the, the guys from DraftKings. So hopefully they'll oh, be yeah. back on and we'll have some football to talk about, you know, let's mm -hmm. hope. Um, Amen. I want to I want to end with just sort of this notion of you know we've been so tactical the last eight weeks right I'm, you guys too I'm sure just making sure you're there for customers making sure your employees are okay um, but as we start to think about coming out of this you know into a post COVID era which you know, looks like it's going to be with us for a while but we're getting back to you know quasi opening um, so I'm hearing you know hybrid is here to stay we agree for sure. Cyber resiliency is very interesting. I, I think you know, one of the things we've said is that, that companies may sub-optimize near-term profitability to make sure that they've got the flexibility and resilience, business resiliency in place. You know, that's obviously something that is, I think, good news for you guys. But, but I'll start with Paul and then maybe, Brian, you can bring us home. How do you see this sort of emergence from this lockdown and into the post-COVID era? Yeah, so this is a really interesting topic for me. In fact, I've had um, many discussions over the last couple of weeks with some of our investors, as well as uh, with our executive staff. And so my personal belief is that the way uh, buying and selling has occurred for IT specifically at the enterprise level is about to go through a transformation no different than uh, we watched the transformation of SaaS businesses when you basically replaced a cold calling salesperson um, with an inside and a, um, you know uh, inbound marketing kind of effort followed up with SDR and BDR. Because um, what we're finding is that our clients now are able to meet more frequently because we don't have the, uh, the friction of an airplane ride or, uh, or a physical building to go through. Uh, and so like that, that whole thing has been removed from the sales process. And so it's interesting to me that one of the things that I'm starting to see is that the amount of activity that our sales organization is doing and the amount of like physical calls that we're going on, they happen to be online, however, um, is way higher than what we're doing. So you couple that with the cost savings of not traveling around the globe and not being in offices. And, and I really think that the, those companies that embrace this new model uh, are going to find ways to penetrate more customers uh, in a less expensive way. Uh, and I do believe that the professional sales, enterprise salesperson of tomorrow is going to look different than it looks today. And so I'm super excited to be in a company that is smack dab in the middle of selling to enterprise clients and, and watching us learn together how we're going to buy, sell, and market to each other uh, in this post-COVID way. Because I'm the only thing I really do know, it's just not going to be the way it used to be. What is it going to look like? I think all of us are placing bets and I don't think anybody has the answer yet, but it's going to look different for sure. Yeah, very, very thoughtful comments. And so Brian, you know, our, our thinking is the differentiation and the war gets, gets won in digital. How is that affecting, you know, sort of your marketing and your thinking around that? We, um, we fortunately decided um, coming into 2020, um, our fiscal 21, that we were actually going to overweight digital anyway. Um, we felt that um, it, it was far more effective. We were seeing far better conversion rates. Uh, we, we saw um, you know, way better ROI in terms of very targeted, competitive digital campaigns or, or general purpose ABM type of efforts. Um, so our, our strategy had essentially been set and, and what this provided us uh, is the opportunity to essentially redirect all of the other funds um, into digital. Um, so, you know, we, we have essentially a two pronged marketing, um, you know, attack right now, which is, you know, digital creating inbounds and BDRs that are calling on those inbounds that are created for digital. Uh, and so it's a, uh, you know, it's, it's going to be a really interesting um, transition back when physical events, if and when they, they do actually come back into form. Um, you know, how much we decide to actually go back into that, that venue. I think that, you know, to some, uh, to some extent, we've talked about this in the past, Dave, you know, the physical events and the, the sheer spectacle and the sheer, you know, audacity of having to spend a million dollars just to break through, um, 
that was an unsustainable model. And so I think this is, this is hastening perhaps the decline or demise of um, really silly uh, marketing expense and, and getting back to telling, uh, telling customers what they need to know to help their, and assist their buying journey and their investigation journey into a new technology. I mean, the IT world is hybrid, and I think the events world is also going to be hybrid. I mean, I, in, intimate events, you know, they're going to live on, but they're also going to have a major digital component to them. I'm very excited that, you know, we're, there are a lot of learnings now in digital, uh, especially around events. And by September, the, 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 a lot of the, the bugs are going to be worked out. You know, we, we've been going to, you know, to, it feels like 24 seven, but uh, really excited to have you guys on. Thanks so much. Really looking forward to working with you in, uh, in September at Data Driven. So guys, Thanks a lot for coming on theCUBE. Oh my gosh, thank you, Dave. So nice to, so nice to be here, thank you. All right, thanks, Dave, stay always, safe. Always a pleasure, you too. And thank you everybody, thank you. And thanks for watching. This is Dave Vellante for theCUBE, and we'll see you next time.